Before we talk about Poirot, do you have a favourite fictional detective? Well, the guy we're talking about, Hercule Poirot. There are a lot of fictional detectives out there capable of solving an insanely complex crime in less time than it takes most people to take a rather large dump. Amongst the most famous is Hercule Poirot, a Belgian detective noted for his numerous eccentricities, all of which were deemed so important to the character that an actor straight up threatened to quit production of one show unless they were included. So which actor was this? This is David Suquette we're talking about, an esteemed British actor who cut his teeth in the theatre and is respected throughout the industry for his dedication to portraying characters as accurately as possible. Which is probably one of the reasons why he was in the front running to play Hercule Poirot when they were going to like make a series for ITV. And the way I describe like David Suquette is just think Daniel Day-Lewis if Daniel Day-Lewis looked like a bank manager from the early 20th century. Because like the picture on his Wikipedia page just looks so fucking stern. He looks like, uh, what was that? that? That evil headmaster from that BBC TV show. What was that? <laughs> what do you mean? What was, the, what was the name of that the show? The Demon Headmaster. The Demon Headmaster. Yeah, he looks like you could play him. So Suquet is one of those actors who's very dedicated to fully embodying a character. Yes, and when he was cast as Hercule Poirot, he set about reading every single like Agatha Christie novel starring the character, every short story, and even the fucking like you know transcripts from the play that he appeared in briefly. Like every scrap of information about this character written by Christie and was absorbed by Suquet and compiled into this huge dossier on the character, which he would refer to before scenes. And he even took to carrying like notes that were specifically important or relevant to a given scene or episode they were filming that day on him at all times, so he could refer to it if he ever forgot. Now, I'm probably going to offend you a little bit. Here. Okay. But I think it's important for me and for other people in the audience who might know, I don't know a lot about Poirot. Well, he's a fucking big dick Belgian detective. The thing is, I didn't like Poirot until I had a housemate who would get stoned and watch Poirot. <laughs> and I just got really into it through them. And I came in once and they were just crying because it's the last episode where he dies. <laughs> and it's like, because he's so old. And I've been watching all the episodes where he's like, he's young and he's, he's full of vim and vigor. And he's solving crimes and he's like, you know, being all dashing and handsome and witty and charming. And then the last episode, he's just dead. And he's like, no, Poirot! <laughs> and just got, it's so funny. There's nothing more depressing than when you're like going back through a series from the first few episodes, but then skip to a later episode and everyone's just, oh, Old. Yeah, oh, oh. Just, oh, you can tell the actors have just given up. Mm. Like when you watch that later seasons of Lost or something like that, and you can just tell the actors are so fucking done, but they want that paycheck. And for the people at home, it's just an example of how dedicated to portraying Poirot as accurately as possible in regards to the original novels he appeared in, David Suquette was. His little dossier that he compiled featured information as innocuous as how Poirot took his afternoon tea, which for the curious is with three or four lumps of sugar. And what would happen if you didn't do three or four lumps of sugar? Well, there's a story about that where Suquette said one time, I was like, you know, in a scene, and I had to, like, you know, pour a cup of tea, make, prepare a cup of tea as Poirot, and I went, oh, no, I forgot. How many lumps of sugar does Poirot take? So I guess three. And then I called my wife immediately afterwards, and she said, oh, no, it says in your notes that he takes four. And he's like, oh, no, I have to redo the scene now. And she said, well, actually, no, it says he sometimes takes three. And he went, oh, thank God. <laughs> and he, well, the thing is, he would have reshot that scene if that would have been wrong. And according to Suquette, the Agatha Christie estate went as far to congratulate him on his performance for it being so accurate to what the original novel said. And that's a baller-ass thing to say as an actor, isn't it? It's like the estate of the person who wrote the novels that I'm appearing in said, fucking well done, mate. And bear in mind that Poirot has been portrayed multiple times by multiple other actors, and Suquette is the only one to have received that honour, which must really suck for the other actors who played him. And as we so often do, Brad, let's just, you know, branch off this path of talking about, like, you know, the main thing in the article today. We just veer off into unknown territory, specifically roles that actors played so well, they can never be replaced. Like, it's their, their performance is the definitive performance of this character, like, similar to Suquette with Poirot. And I'm going to open up with Arnold fucking Schwarzenegger as the Terminator. So I think they will never recast the Terminator. They're going to fucking try, they've tried so many times, but they will never ever replace him as the fucking Terminator. Yeah, they keep trying to recast people and they just, the, the character is so synonymous with the person that it doesn't work. Like, yeah. Han Solo is a good example. Yeah. Oh, they, God. They cast, what was his face? Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly, what was his face? I never remember his name, but yeah. You know we, what? Weird or, weird or strange man as uh, Han Solo. You mean that guy they had to bring in acting coaches to teach him how to act? Harry Potter is one way. Like, if someone else was playing him, I'd probably be like, it's not Daniel Radcliffe. The thing is, though, they will eventually reboot that, or they'll do side stories. Well, no, they'll, they'll do a movie version of Cursed Child. Yeah, 
And they will recast everybody. Or they'll, just, or they'll just wait 12 or so years and just get Daniel Radcliffe in. Even though... No, they'll put me in the old man makeup from the end of <laughs> Deathly Hallows. That looks super, super bad. <laughs> So, oh, my, my favourite bit about that is, like, some of the actors came off so much worse in that. So, like, Tom Felton, they aged him up so much with the makeup, and then they've got, like, the girl playing Ginny Weasley, and they put, like, a line here, and that's it. She still looks like she's, like, 18. <laughs> I just like to imagine that when Harry looked over at Malfoy, he's like, that's right, my wife's still looking fine. <laughs> I won the lottery. Get what the fuck is your thing? You made fun of me for dating a ginger. Look, I'm dating. Dickhead. I, I killed, like, Wizard Hill. What the fuck did you do, asshole? Get out. You built a fucking, what is it? A cupboard. That was, <laughs> the, was, the, that was the, the vanishing cabinet. Yeah, the extent of your, like, you know, contribution was, like, you built a cupboard that let a werewolf eat somebody. Dickhead. <laughs> this just went from Poirot to ripping on Malfoy. Boy, he's such a dickhead. So Sue kept being so dedicated to Poirot, did yes. he stay in character the entire time? Of course he did. That's the bread and butter of all method actors, isn't it? They stayed in character during the entire time they were filming, and it's reported that he would be Poirot for the entire day of Isn't filming. Isn't Poirot a dick? Yes, that's the point, because obviously... Suquette's not a dick, he's a lovely grandfatherly man. On the other hand, Poirot is a bit of a dick. After you cut my hair last week, I went home and I measured each sideburn. As I suspected, the left one was three millimeters longer than the right. Let us make the effort, Monsieur Bennett, not to make a similar travesty today. What is it about Poirot that makes him unsavory to be around? It's because in the original novels he appears and he's described as having numerous obsessive compulsive tendencies, as well as like a whole host of grating idiosyncrasies. Um, like one example of which is the fact that he absolutely refuses to eat bread that is irregularly sized. So if he sees a loaf of bread that is irregularly sized, he will refuse to eat it. He also refuses to eat eggs if you give him two eggs and they're of different sizes, shapes or colours. So if you order them in a restaurant, he'd send them back? Yes. Well, Poirot would, and obviously Suquette didn't go to a restaurant as Poirot, but he did do, obviously, go to lunch. And obviously, if someone brought him his lunch and it just so happened to, like, you know, be irregularly sized, he would send it back in character towards Poirot. I cannot eat these eggs. They are of totally different sizes. So Suquette is considered to be the definitive Poirot. Yes, and that's one of the reasons people, like, tolerated him staying in character, as annoying as that was, because they realised the performance we're getting out of him is, like, the best anyone has ever seen for this character, to the point where, like I said, the Agatha Christie estate is like, fucking well done, mate. And this makes it all the more hilarious that the series that he appeared in, which ran for 25 years, like, you know, on and off, uh, almost got killed in the crib when a director insisted that they knew what Poirot would do better than David Suquette. You know, the guy who literally carried around a file on what Poirot would do in any given situation. So there's a story here? Yes, there is, and it all happened over a handkerchief because in one of the earliest episodes of the first series, um, Poirot walks over and sits on a bench. And what David Suquette did is only walked over to the bench, he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket, lightly dusted it, put it down, sat on it. Director goes, what the fuck are you doing, mate? And, and David Suquette explains to the director, presumably in character was Poirot, that the, like, the bench was dirty and, you know, he's going to clean it before he sits down. The director said, no, that's stupid do the scene again. Does the scene again, exactly the same thing. The handkerchief comes out, dusts the bench, sits down on it. This devolves into a screaming argument um, during which Suquette says, I will walk off production if you do not let me include this scene. And I would like to remind people at this point, just one more time, that Suquette, prior to taking on this role, read literally every piece of literature to exist about Poirot, so he kind of knew what the fuck he was talking about. And the director and Suquette, they argued for a long time, until producer walked over and said, okay, we need to sort this out, what the fuck is going on? Because well, director says he's trying to like put a handkerchief down, it looks stupid. To which Suquette responded, it literally says in one Agatha Christie novel that Poirot will not sit down before he cleans, like, you know, or dusts the area he's going to sit on. What I'm doing is 100% in character. And the producer went, well, yeah, he's right, put the scene in. <laughs> and they let him do it. Well, there were other arguments that happened during that first season. It's like Sue Ketz, I think it was on Good Morning or something like that, when he was talking to the host, said, oh yeah, I nearly walked off production like multiple times when they tried to make me wear an outfit that Poirot wouldn't wear because I, was, I wanted to be very true to the character. 
And I just like to think now that throughout the entire first season, every single time he was questioned, he just said, I'll walk off set. I had my brief and I wanted to do it as she wrote it. And when I wasn't allowed to do that because they wanted to do something different, I said, well, no, if I'm going to be Agatha Christie's Poirot, then I must be him in totality. Mm. And the people out there might be thinking, that makes me sound like a dickhead. But remember, this is the definitive performance of the character that was lauded by the Agatha Christie fucking fact, like the people in charge of the property themselves said. Like, Agatha Christie could not have cast a better person if she tried to play this fucking role. And like, it was lauded critically as like, a massive commercial success. So he fucking knew what he was doing. But I just think it's really funny that just every single time a director questioned him, he went, well, I read all the books and you didn't. Also, I'm an actor, fuck you, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Thinking about it now, like not just with detectives, but the idea of there being like a quirky genius is like a, an actually a really common trope. Yeah, it's weirdly specific, but it is like you know quite prevalent in fiction. It's um, probably one of my favourite tropes. It's the bunny ears lawyer. People don't. What? It's, that's the name of it, and it's uh, and the idea is it's uh, a person who is so good at their job that their superiors will overlook any and all personality quirks. Um, and the example often given is like this theoretical lawyer who wears bunny ears at all times, but they're so good you don't give a shit. And um, like obviously Poirot is one such example of a bunny ears lawyer. He's a detective, he's, he's quirky, he's eccentric, he's like, you know, obsessive compulsive, but he always gets his man. And I think there's like, there's other examples that I think, um, Adrian Monk from the TV show Monk is another example of that way. He's an obsessive compulsive detective who's always right and everyone tolerates him for that reason. I mean, most famously Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, yeah. And, and I guess any, any derivative like yeah. House. They're all the same. Yeah. Arseholes or weirdos, but then they're so fantastic that everyone accepts yeah. it. Yeah. It's like, you know what? I will tolerate you being a dick. Like, they even say that in house once, don't they? Oh, he treats one person a week. It's like he cures one person a week. And I've always loved the idea of those characters when other characters get introduced to try and question them. Like, Monk is a good example of this because in later seasons, even after like a hundred episodes of him never being wrong and always being 100% right about every single theory he ever posits, however wild and insane it sounds, he starts his superior saying, well, he's a weirdo, we don't have to listen to him. It's like, he has a flawless prosecution record. He is never wrong. And you're still questioning this man. It's like House, isn't it, where even after like nine seasons, he'll come out with some wild theory about what's wrong with a person. And all of his subordinates will say, well, your, your proposed treatment will kill him. He goes, when have I ever been wrong? Have I ever once been wrong about any single case we've ever talked about ever before? Why are you still questioning me after like 400 episodes? Yeah, and then he goes to his superiors and asks for the treatment that he said. And they'll say, no, that's even if it is true, this won't work, etc." Does it without permission, saves them. And they're always like, well, you know, you, sh you shouldn't have done it anyway. <laughs> I am always 100% right. I've never been wrong. It's so dumb. It's like, oh man. Another personal favourite example of mine is uh, in the show Lie to Me, which we discussed before. Dr. Carl Lightman, played by Tim Roth. Again, a weirdo who is an expert on deception and can basically tell when someone's lying. Constantly being questioned by people who don't understand what he's doing, despite the fact he is never wrong. Another one, the mentalist Patrick Jane, who has the ability again to like, you know, read people, surmise what their intentions are, guess what they're going to do is never wrong about any of his hunches, is constantly second-guessed by everybody around him. You get it as well in uh, police procedurals. Yep. You'll, you'll have the rogue cop. Oh, I would fire you for all the damage you've caused, but you're just too good. Yeah. Yeah. Like Lethal Weapon, you got rigs. Or, like, you know, just even just police shows like CSI. Mm -hmm. Grissom, never fucking wrong. Oh, but he's deaf, so we can't trust him. It's like, but he's never wrong. He's always right now, but he's deaf. What does that have to do with anything? No, but he's deaf, innit? So he's never wrong. It's oh, so good. Yeah, like if I worked alongside Horatio Kane, and he keeps crapping, cracking one-liners next to dead bodies. And wearing sunglasses at night. Yeah, wearing sunglasses what? indoors at night, yeah. Do you know what, though? He's never wrong. That's why I love the trope of the bunny is like, they're so competent they can't be fired. But the idea that people constantly undermine and second-guess them. Monk is the best example of this, though, because there is an episode where they ignore his hunch in favour of one from a fucking psychic. <laughs> And is this first season before they know how no, good he is? this is like seven seasons in or some shit. It's like he has never been wrong his entire career. And they just say, no, let's just listen to this fucking psychic. Instead of the guy with the absolute flawless record who has never been wrong the entire time he's been in charge, because he's a bit weird.